from the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City. The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. My name is Chase Robinson. I'm the interim president of the Graduate Center. And I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's event. I'm told it's the hottest ticket in town. Now, be that as it may, the response, I think, is testimony to the enormous interest in Professor Piketty's work and the topic of inequality more generally. Now, Professor Gornick, to my right, will speak briefly to the latter in her comments, but I'd be remiss if I failed to explain why this is important and this timely discussion should take place here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Here at the crossroads of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street, we are the center of the university's network of advanced teaching and research, especially in the theoretical and social sciences and the humanities. We're a graduate school of arts and sciences. We're a constellation of some 35 centers and institutes of applied and theoretical research. And we're a platform for performance, discussion, and debate in some a community of 7,000 students, scholars, and researchers dedicated to the idea that learning is a public good. We put this principle into action in a variety of ways. One is through teaching. Our faculty and doctoral students share their research in classrooms in every borough of the city, teaching about 200,000 New Yorkers every year. Another is our public programming and tonight's event is exemplary. It's exemplary, I think, in many respects, one of which is that it reflects the value this institution places upon evidence and data-based debate. In a public sphere saturated by opinion, it seems to me that public institutions have a special role in fostering such reason debate, whatever the topic may be. The event also exemplifies something even more obvious, our commitment to making fundamental contributions to understanding problems of pressing and public concern. And there could, I trust, scarcely be one more pressing and public than that which we address tonight, facing, as Paul Krugman said earlier today, a potential political economy spiral of inequality. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Graduate Center's Advanced Research Collaborative, which fosters the interdisciplinary research that makes such understanding possible, and the Luxembourg Income Study Center, which is one of the Graduate Center's great assets. An internationally renowned data archive and research center devoted to enabling comparative work on socioeconomic inequalities. The director of the center is Janet Gornick, who is also a professor of political science and sociology. She has been widely recognized for many years for her scholarship on gender inequality, and recently she has turned her attention to income inequality. Her edited volume, Income Inequality, Economic Disparities in the Middle Class in Affluent Countries, was published just last year by Stanford. Janet, I hand the podium to you. I want to begin my brief remarks by telling you what it is that we do at LIS that will illuminate why we, in particular, are so thrilled to host this event tonight. In short, we gather data sets from around the world, now from nearly 50 countries, and we harmonize them into a common template so that researchers and policymakers can use them for comparative research. Since our founding in 1983, over 5,000 researchers have used the LIS data and most of their work has been aimed at understanding the nature and the institutional roots of income inequality, of poverty, and of labor market disparities, in addition to making data available to a large and expanding virtual community of scholars. We carry out research. We set methodological standards. We serve as a repository for scholarship based on our data. We inform journalists and NGOs around the world, and we teach and train. Over 500 young scholars are alumni of our annual summer workshop, including a dozen of the Graduate Center's own PhD students. In the last three years, we've been incredibly busy. 
as I'm sure all of you know, uh, what we've seen recently uh, is an extraordinary development that's unfolded. Concerns about inequality have attracted unprecedented attention in the United States and in many other countries. And this attention is cross-cutting academic research, the media, and public discourse. A confluence of factors has sparked and intensified this international conversation about high and rising inequality. The Occupy movement captured worldwide attention. Scholars have produced fresh accounts of inequality's origins, nature, and effects, and contributors and activists have contributed vivid stories and innovative visualizations, and new data have been created and analyzed. <clears throat> one of the most exciting developments has been the launching of an original data source, one that lends the empirical foundation to the book that we're celebrating this evening. I'm referring to the World Top Incomes Database, a singular achievement for which we thank Thomas Piketty and his international colleagues. Let me pause to note something, something that's well known to inequality researchers but might be less well known to some of you in the audience. Household surveys, the core ingredient of our work at LIS, tell us an immense amount about the whole of income distributions, with one exception. They're not well suited, for technical reasons, to looking at the very top. For research on the wealthiest of the wealthy, a different approach, a complementary one, has long been needed. Thomas and his colleagues have finally filled this crucial hole with the launching of these data, data that are built from historical tax records. And these new data illuminate what survey data cannot, the top of the top, thus allowing us to peek at the part of the distribution that was until now largely behind a curtain. At LIS, we consider this fantastic database to be a sibling of sorts, and together the two data sources owe a great deal to our shared colleague and intellectual mentor, the British economist Sir Tony Atkinson. But excellent data come to life only through excellent analyses, and no data could hope for more than Thomas Piketty and this astonishing book. Indeed, capital in the 21st century is drenched in data. Its claims rest on a mountain of evidence. But of course, the book is not only descriptive, it's innovative theoretically, integrating economic and historical methods to build a novel framework for understanding capital accumulation, economic growth, and rising inequality. The book is also boldly prescriptive, laying out a sweeping plan for transforming public finance on a global scale. And it's gorgeously written. It's a masterpiece of clear exposition. Tonight, we're joined by five remarkable scholars. I'm going to introduce them with all the brevity that I can muster and in reverse order of their appearance. Branko Milanovic is one of the world's most prominent scholars of global inequality. He was, for many years, lead economist at the World Bank. In January of this year, he joined us here at the Graduate Center, where he serves as senior scholar in the List Center and visiting presidential professor. Stephen Durloff, professor at the University of Wisconsin, is author and editor of many books and articles. He currently serves as editor of the Journal of Economic Literature, which I might add will soon publish Bronco's review of capital in the 21st century. Paul Krugman, professor at Princeton University, is known for his extensive body of academic work, his much-read column in the New York Times, and his lively blog. He's received an array of honors, including the 2008 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, and Professor Krugman will soon change his home institution. This July, he'll become Distinguished Scholar in the List Center here at the Graduate Center, and in 2015, he'll join the faculty of our PhD program in economics. Joseph Stiglitz, professor at Columbia University, is also recognized for a remarkable body of scholarship. He has served inside and outside of academia and recently has been a leading voice in public discussions about the price of inequality. He too has received countless honors, including somehow two Nobel Prizes. <laughs> he was awarded the 2001 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, and he served as lead author for the panel on climate change that won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Thomas Piketty is professor at the Paris School of Economics and arguably today the world's foremost scholar of inequality of income and of wealth. Thomas, welcome. Welcome to the Graduate Center. Let me tell you what I've tried to do in this book. So this is really um, a book uh, about uh, the historical evolution of income and wealth. So, you know, the primary objective of this book is to put together uh, a lot of historical data uh, that we have been collecting uh, over the past 15 years, and I'm trying to put this 
uh, this body of data in a, in a coherent manner. But you know, I should I should stress right away that this comes really from a collective research process. And you know, the book is a, uh, I am the single author of the book, and I am responsible for all the mistakes that are in the book. But uh, I'm not. Uh, you know, I could never have collected this data on my own. So I started working on France about 15 years ago, and then I was very lucky to find with uh, Tony Atkinson. Uh, Tony did the same for, the, for Britain with Emmanuel Saez. We did the same for the US uh, with Facundo Alvaredo. We studied uh, uh, Argentina with Abhijit Banerjee. We studied India with Gilles Postelvinet, Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, and Gabriel Dupin. We studied the long-run evolution of wealth. Uh, rather than simply income. And, you know, I cannot uh, uh, refer to everyone, but overall, we have, as I think, put together the, the, the most extensive uh, set of historical data on income and wealth. Uh, uh, and, and this book is simply trying to, you know, to give access to this data to everyone. So there is a database that's online which can easily access. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do my best in this book to try to explain what we find. But, you know, I certainly don't claim uh, that, you know, I have a perfect explanation for everything. You know, there's a lot of missing data. We have, uh, at least we know more than we used to know, which is uh, good, but uh, we still know uh, very little. Uh, we are in the social sciences and, uh, uh, you know, in part four of the book, I try to draw some conclusion about the future and about policy, but, you know, let me make clear right away that, you know, just like everybody, I am better at analyzing the past uh, than the future. And, uh, uh, you know, you can very well disagree with everything that's in part four and still find some interest in what's in part one, two, and three. And ultimately, the objective of the book is not to tell you what's going to happen, but rather to, to give everybody a chance to write their own uh, part four and to sort of make their own mind about, uh, 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 you know, this evolution of income and wealth distribution. And, you know, these economic issues uh, belong to everyone and certainly not only to economists. So the, the, my mission as a scholar is simply, you know, my only advantage is that I have spent a lot of time collecting this data and the objective of the book is to uh, try to, to, you know, to show what I have found. So, you know, in this presentation, I will present a few results. You know, all graphs and series uh, can be accessed online and, um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, but I will, of course, not present everything. So, there are really two big parts of data that I put together in this book. One comes from the World Top Income Database that Janet was referring to. So, the countries in red are in the database, the countries in blue are about to enter the database. So, being in the database means that we use the historical uh, data on income uh, uh, since the creation of the income tax. So the advantage of the uh, income tax data is not only that you can look at the top in a, in a better way than, than uh, you can do with self-reported uh, survey data, but it's also that it has been available for a long time. You know, you don't have income survey for 1914, but you have an income tax uh, that was created uh, in the US in 1913, in France in 1914, in the UK in 1909, but also in India in 1922, you know, there is a, a number of ex-colonies where the colonial power created the income tax quite early. So we, we put together this, this income tax data together with national income accounts in order to compute the evolution of uh, uh, the share of top income groups in uh, total income. So an, an example of what we get is this curve for the United States where you have on this graph uh, the evolution of the share uh, of total uh, U.S. income uh, going to the top 10 percent. And so you see this big decline in the first part of the century, which is what Kuznets in the 1950s found. And so Kuznets was the first economist to produce the income inequality series using the same method that we are using, and which is the only method. You use income tax data uh, for top incomes and national accounts for the, for the, for the aggregate uh, income uh, denominator. So all what we've been doing, you know, is to extend Kuznets' work to uh, many more years and many more countries. So Kuznets had one country for 35 years and we have over 20 countries for an entire century. And this changes quite a bit what we can conclude. So in particular, you can see that adding the second half of the uh, on the picture uh, uh, changes quite a bit the, the conclusions that you can draw. So 
you know, in the in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, Kuznets had this very optimistic conclusion that uh, inequality of income uh, tends to reduce in advanced uh, stages of development, and that you know this is the end of the story. And during the Cold War period and during the post-war period, you know there was this this view that you know this was the end of the story. Now in the past 30 years, you've had this huge increase in the share uh, going to the top. So. You know, this, this, I, I, actually, I have not put the latest data point that we have put online with uh, Emmanuel Saez uh, uh, recently for 2012, but now for 2012, we are a bit above 50%. Okay, so, so the trend seems to be continuing. You know, there was a decline in, in, uh, uh, in particular in capital gains uh, uh, following the crisis uh, and also following the 2001, uh, uh, you know, uh, end of the, of the internet bubble. but. In 2012, you are already uh, above the, the 2007 uh, uh, point. So, you know, the, the process seems to be continuing. And, and obviously, the question is, uh, uh, where is this, go is, is this going to stop? You know, and, and it's important to realize that, you know, we are talking about big numbers because, you know, when you go from 30 to 35 percent of, of uh, national income going to the top 10 to 50 percent going to the top 10, you know, is that going to be 60 percent, 70 percent? You know, so some people tend to believe that, uh, you know, wherever it stops uh, will be the right point. But, you know, uh, uh, at some point, I think, you, you know, you have to look at the numbers. We are talking about big numbers. You know, this was enough to absorb uh, three quarters of uh, U.S. macro growth uh, over the past 30 years. So given that the, the growth performance was not that great, you know, with a per capita GDP growth rate of 1.5 percent, if you have... Uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of that going to the top 10 and mostly to the top 1%, uh, you know, it's not a very good deal for the rest of the population. So, uh, you, you, these numbers, you know, I think need to be looked at seriously. Now, I, I look at them in the book, but the book, uh, for the most part, is trying to look at wealth rather than income. And, uh, you know, both are important, and of course, wealth is partly the accumulation of saving from income, but wealth is a more complicated object because it also involves uh, inherited wealth, it also involves uh, natural resources which have been saved by uh, no one. And so it's a, it's a different, uh, uh, it's a, in a way it's an even more interesting uh, uh, notion and also the inequality of wealth, the concentration of wealth is always uh, more extreme than the concentration of income. I mean it could be differently but it is like that. And also the advantage of the study of wealth is that you can go back uh, through time through the 19th century because you have wealth records uh, starting in the 19th or even 18th century uh, for, for Britain and France, whereas for income you cannot go much, be, much in the 19th century, which is a problem because you cannot put in a broader historical perspective this huge uh, shocks uh, that have happened starting with World War I, World War II, uh, the Great Depression. So let me show you another uh, U-shaped uh, picture uh, of this form but with wealth. So it, it looks a lot like the previous picture because you have this big shock with the World Wars and the recovery in the post-war uh, period, but it is actually a very different picture and a very different process because this is not a picture about inequality per se. This is a picture about the aggregate value of wealth, so this is aggregate net private wealth, so this is what uh, households uh, own in Germany, France, and the UK, uh, as a fraction of uh, national income. Okay? And you can see that, you know, uh, in the late 19th century, we had uh, what I call in the book uh, patrimonial societies, wealth-based society with, uh, uh, you know, six or seven years of national income and wealth. Then you have a big crisis following the war and the Great Depression, and in the 50s, aggregate private wealth is only two to three years of national income. And then you have a gradual recovery, uh, 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 you know, which has, which has uh, taken a very long time. Now, le let me uh, be clear about the fact that this per se does not necessarily imply rising inequality. You know, it could be that, you know, if everybody had an equal share in that wealth, you know, that would not imply uh, necessarily rising inequality. So this is not necessarily bad to have you know, after all, it's good to have a lot of capital, you know, to have a lot of real estate, a lot of equipment, a lot of buildings, and, 
you know, right now in France uh, or in Europe, uh, people talk a lot about public debt, uh, I guess in the US as well. Uh, you know, after all, it's, it's good to have a lot, uh, you know, more capital than debt. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, we sometimes we are worried that we are going to uh, leave a lot of public debt to our children, which is uh, certainly uh, true. But, you know, we are also going to leave uh, more wealth than ever to our children, at least for those who have wealth to transmit. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is, this is good news, except that in practice, the concentration of this capital ownership is, is very large. So in this presentation, well, in the uh, last part of the presentation, and I guess I should try to find some time somewhere or, or make some guess about the time. Uh, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to make three points and, and you know, uh, so the first point is about the return of this patrimonial or wealth-based society uh, in uh, Europe and Japan. And what we observe is that, you know, wealth income ratio, so the aggregate value of wealth relative to income, seem to be returning to very high levels in these low growth uh, countries. And, 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 you know, the basic intuition is that in Europe and Japan, you have very low population growth, uh, much lower than in the US. And uh, in a slow growth society, you know, wealth accumulated in the past can naturally become uh, very important. You know, in the extreme case of a society with zero growth, if you keep saving, you know, 10% of your income each year, you know, you will accumulate an infinite quantity of capital. Well, probably at some point you will, you will uh, stop because, you know, if everybody has 10 floors uh, for his private apartment, you know, the rental value of this uh, capital will go to zero and nobody will accumulate anymore. But as long as you have some growth, uh, this will not go to infinity. You know, the ratio of wealth to income will not go to infinity, but it can get very high. And this is what you have, you know, in a low growth society, you, you know, the, naturally the, the value of wealth accumulated in the past can become very uh, important as long as people keep saving some, some sizable uh, uh, fraction of, the, of uh, their income each year. And in the very long run, this can be uh, relevant for the entire world. Now, the second point that I would like to make is about the future of wealth concentration. So, in the book, you know, one important message is that um, a very strong force pushing toward uh, uh, potentially very large inequalities of wealth is the gap between R and G, where R is the rate of return to wealth and G is the growth rate. And one of the points I'm, I'm trying to make in the book is that with the high R minus G, uh, wealth inequality might uh, return or even be possibly higher than the 19th century level. But, you know, it all depends on, on in the end, of the kind of institutions that we choose to, to democratize wealth or to allow uh, more wealth mobility and people to access wealth. And in particular, uh, you know, a proper uh, a progressive tax on net wealth can be a, a way to, to, uh, to, to try to uh, increase wealth mobility and to make this vast quantity of wealth, which itself is a good thing, uh, um, uh, more equally uh, distributed. Uh, so before I, I, I get uh, uh, to this uh, tax and progressive tax conclusion, let me try to explain a little bit more these two notions of uh, uh, the rate of return uh, to, uh, to capital and the uh, growth rate. So, you know, sometimes people are surprised, you know, when I uh, say that, you know, R can be bigger than G forever. So it's very important to realize that there is n absolutely no logical paradox here. There's absolutely no reason why R and G should be equal. You know, it's as if you were comparing uh, the gravity force with the electromagnetic force uh, exerted by Earth. You know, both are expressed in Newton, but, you know, they have no reasons to be equal. And here, you know, here, both are expressed in percentage, but they have really no reason. It would be an incredible coincidence if they were equal. And in fact, during most of human history, you know, the growth rate was zero. You know, in agrarian traditional societies, you know, the population would have no growth and productivity would have very small growth and so it was growth was close to zero percent and of course R was bigger than G because the rate of return for instance to land or to other assets was typically of the order of four to five percent per year. You know, if you open uh, any uh, novel uh, by Jane Austen or whoever else, you will see that it's obvious for every reader that, uh, you know, the value of a land will be typically 20 or 25 years of the annual rent to this land, so which corresponds to a return of four or five percent. So every reader knows that if you want to have 1,000 pounds per year 
in annual uh, living in order to pay your domestic servants and, and have a certain standard of living, you need to have a capital of 20,000 pounds. So that 5% of 20,000 pounds will give you 1,000 pounds. And it is so obvious for everybody that, you know, Jane Austen doesn't have to explain it because wealth is about, uh, you know, the life of, of, of these people, both the masters and the servants uh, depend on this. So in a way, R bigger than G was even the foundation of society. R bigger than G was what made it possible for a, a landed uh, group, a group uh, of owners, to uh, live uh, uh, and, and to do something else in their lives and care about their survival and to have uh, you know, living standards out of the return to their property. Now, with the Industrial Revolution in the uh, late 18th and 19th century, there was an increase in the growth rate, but it's important to realize that you know, the growth rate, even with industrial growth and a lot of technical innovation. Uh, in the 19th century, it was not larger than 1 to 1.5% per year. So that was not enough to counteract the fact that the rate of returns tend to be of 4 or 5%. And to me, this is the central uh, explanation as to why uh, the concentration of wealth uh, you know, in the 19th century uh, and, and until World War I in European societies uh, you know, was not lower than in ancien regime societies. You know, it was just as large, and if not larger. And in fact, the data on wealth concentration, and I'm not going to be able to show you the graph, is that you actually have rising wealth concentration until World War I uh, in Britain and in France. And you know, it's, it's very funny, because in France at that time, you know, a big part of the financial and, and political elite was saying, well, you know, we've done the French Revolution, so now uh, we have done our job, and, 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 and we are a country of small property owners, thanks to the French Revolution, so we are not like in Britain, where, you know, they are this aristocratic country, and, you know, they should introduce a progressive estate tax or a progressive income tax, but we don't need it, because now we don't have the landed uh, aristocracy, except that in 1910, you know, land does not matter. Uh, unless what you see in Downton Abbey, but you know it's only because it's Downton Abbey. But you know, in the in the in the real life of, of British wealth holders of the time, you know, land was less than five percent of national wealth. What mattered in 1910 was already uh, you know financial assets, real estate assets, business assets, and the concentration of those assets in a republic like France uh, did not work differently than in a monarchy like Britain. So you know, I'm very happy to to wake up in a republic each morning, but you know, I don't think this makes a lot, a lot of a difference in terms of concentration of wealth. And in fact, the concentration of wealth was just as large uh, in France prior to World War I than, to, uh, 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 than in Britain. Now, in the 20th century, this inequality between R and G uh, was uh, uh, altered for two reasons. And uh, maybe let me uh, show you very quickly. Uh, uh, hop. So, you know, this is some estimate of the rate of return, and this is the growth rate of world output. You know, what happened in the, in the 20th century is, is that you have unusually large growth rate. That's partly due to the recovery uh, after uh, uh, World War II, or, you know, you had a, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe and Japan, you have four, five percent growth per year in the 50s, 60s, 70s, but that's partly because of the reconstruction following World War II. The other reason why you have very high growth rate uh, in the 20th century, the more positive reason, uh, it's not the war, it's due to very large population growth. Okay? And it's important to realize that you know, this is a big part of, of growth uh, historically, you know, particularly in the United States, of course, which is a, a country that's uh, in a way based on perpetual population growth, which is what we all uh, love in America, but at the same time, which makes the study of the US in a way not generalizable to the rest of the world because, you know, the, U.S. population was multiplied by 100 uh, over the past two centuries, from three to 300. Uh, probably that's not going to happen to the planet in the next two centuries. Uh, the population of France just rose from 30 million at the time of the French Revolution to 60 million today. So, you know, this is still the same country, almost the same families, almost the same buildings in Paris. And in, in a way, in a way, you know, this is more relevant for the rest, uh, you know, for the, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the planet for the, for, uh, for the future because, you know, probably, you know, maybe the world population is still going to grow, it's going to be multiplied by two, but, you know, according to UN population projection is actually going to stop growing 
and, and the US case, uh, you know, even for the US uh, uh, population was 100 million uh, uh, one century ago, around 1900, it's 300 million today. Is it going to be 900 million one century from now? You know, maybe yes, maybe not. But in any case, whatever happens will have a big importance on the balance between the rate of return to capital and the growth rate. And a big part of the decline in the growth rate uh, uh, will have to do with the uh, decline in population growth. The other thing that happened in the 20th century is that you have large capital loss. So uh, during the World War period in particular, so this was the before tax and before destruction rate of return. But if you take into account, if you take into account the capital loss and taxation, then you can see that the, the, uh, you know, the, during the 20th century, this inequality between the rate of return, the after tax rate of return, and the growth rate was completely reversed. And it was reversed due to very unusual events, you know, World War I, World War II, uh, and also to this large population growth, uh, which at this stage uh, uh, are unlikely to, to uh, happen again. And certainly for the work part, uh, we should not, uh, you know, uh, hope that they happen again. And, and this implies that, you know, it's quite likely that this gap will rise again in the future. Now, one very uh, concrete example of this, and. Uh, uh, you know, um, is, uh, you know, this is a concrete example of R bigger than G. So this is the rise, you know, the top of the world distribution of wealth, according to Forbes magazine, you know, which is a very, uh, uh, I'm certainly not claiming that this is a reliable data source, but, you know, we live at a time, you know, we live in a time where people uh, uh, buy magazines in order to have information about uh, top wealth, you know, I would prefer that they buy, uh, you know, UN or IMF uh, uh, statistical publication, but they won't find the information in the statistical publication. So, you know, people are waiting for information. So let's see what we get. What we get is that the, if you compute a top, you know, a fixed fraction of the population of the world, uh, and you look at the average wealth of this group, uh, so of course some, some people, these are not the same people over the period, you know, some people get out, some people come in, you have new, uh, billionaires coming from emerging countries, and that's fine. But uh, what you see is that the average wealth of this group, you know, has been rising uh, at, you know, between 6.4, 6.8 percent per year, which is, you know, three times as fast um, as uh, average uh, wealth uh, per adult in the world. So, you know, if the top of the distribution is rising three times as fast as the average, you know, this means that we are in a sequence of rising uh, concentration of wealth. And you know the question is how far uh, how far this can uh, this can go. So let me just conclude that by you know saying uh, two, two, two things. You know first you know the study of history. Uh, you know I think is important uh, because uh, you know a lot of what's happening now uh, you know has already happened in the past. So for instance, in particular, you know the study of pre World War One capitalism, you know, I think is very important for the future. You know, I have read uh, some reviews, uh, uh, you know, I will not give names, but who say that, you know, these were agrarian societies, you know, in Europe before World War One. so what can we learn about, you know, the, our future uh, century uh, with all this nice innovation? You know, 1900 was a time where uh, we invented, you know, the automobile, uh, the electricity, the radio, uh, the transatlantic steam. So, you know, of course, this is much less important than Facebook, but, you know, still, these are, you know, these are important innovations. And, and still, these very important innovations, uh, you know, were not, you know, they brought some mobility, of course, in the way solution. You did have entrepreneurs at that time, just like you have today. But this also brought a huge concentration of wealth because this growth rate that you had with all this innovation of 1, 1.5 percent per year, uh, was not enough to counteract the fact that the rate of return was 5, 6% and led to very large concentration of wealth because initial wealth inequalities tend to get amplified. You know, R bigger than G uh, does not imply uh, that uh, uh, wealth inequality uh, will uh, rise indefinitely because, you know, at some point in the life of family, uh, you know, things happen, you know, some, someone uh, dilapidates the wealth or someone goes bankrupt or the family has too many children or too few or, you know, many things happen. So there will be some, there will always be some mobility, but, but for a bigger R minus G, uh, you know, the wealth concentration in equilibrium 
toward which the society will tend to converge can be very large wealth concentration. So it will not be infinite, but it can be extremely large. And potentially, I think this could be quite threatening both for economic mobility and economic uh, dynamism and economic growth, and also for the proper working of our democratic uh, institutions. Uh, so, uh, you know, the EID all solution, as I say, will be a progressive tax on net wealth. I will not elaborate too much about this, except for saying that, you know, the history of taxation is full of surprise. And, you know, uh, many people, so this is a short history of, of income taxation and top income tax rate over the past centuries. Uh, so you can see, you know, many people in 1900, 1910, uh, in particular in this country, were saying that, you know, the progressive income tax uh, will never happen. And, and indeed, the constitution of this country made it impossible at that time. And, and still it happened, you know, so sometimes things happen and, 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 you know, I'm not terribly impressed by people who claim they know uh, what's going to happen or not going to happen and people who say, you know, there will never be a, a progressive wealth tax, you know, I don't know what they would have said in 1900, 1910. Uh, let, let me just insist that the United States uh, uh, of America invented progressive taxation largely because they didn't want to look like class-ridden Europe. You know, I know this can seem very strange, but, you know, uh, Irving Fisher, when he was uh, uh, president of the American Economic, Association, uh, American Economic Association in 1919 and was giving his big presidential speech, uh, you know, was saying, you know, my fellow American economists, be uh, careful, there is a risk that we become as unequal as Europe, and this is the biggest threat for the American economy. And, you know, today this can seem completely crazy, but this is one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. invented uh, this very high top tax rate. You know, the only time where G when Germany has such a high tax rate uh, is actually uh, in 1946-48 when the uh, tax policy of Germany uh, is chosen uh, by the Americans, and this is the Allied Control Council <laughs> that's choosing the tax rate. And then, and, and this is the same in Japan. This is exactly the same. This is the only time where you have a 90% top tax rate in Japan is 1946-1948. And this was not to punish the Germans or the Japanese, because the U.S. were doing the same at home. So this was part of the civilization package, basically. You bring democracy, and you bring progressive taxation, because this was at the time the view in America of what it takes to uh, avoid excessive incomes. So, you know, this lasted for half a century. Apparently, this did not destroy uh, American capitalism, uh, probably because this was applied only to uh, those very excessive incomes that we see today, you know, above one million or two million dollars, uh, where, you know, which are just not needed uh, to get growth. Uh, and in fact, you know, growth, if anything, was higher before 1980s than it has been uh, um, uh, more recently. So let me stop there. I assume I've already been too long. Uh, and just to, you know, conclude that, uh, you know, the future can be uh, full of surprise. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I am supposed to give the floor to uh, Joe Stiglitz. Oh, okay. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. What I want to do in a, the next few minutes is to go over some of the ideas uh, that he talked about, try to talk about some of the things that I thought were uh, most important, and then to, to talk very briefly about some of the things that uh, he, uh, the book stimulated me to think about. So the, um, the fundamental contribution, as, as he pointed out, was to prov uh, providing us data w with what has actually happened to the distribution uh, of income and of wealth. Um, and and I, it should be, you know, really, uh, really enlightening. Some of us went to uh, graduate school at a particular period in his curve when things were looking very good. <laughs> and uh, it gave us a very distorted view of the world. And it's nice to see what the world was like before, and very bad to see what it was afterwards. So, so we, so it, it really is important for for those of us who who, who uh, spent our time in a, a particular period. Uh, there are so many aspects of what he pointed out that were, uh, you know, uh, very much touching on on uh, what life was like at at the particular time we were in graduate school. 
one of the numbers he pointed out was the capital output ratio was two, two or three, between two and three. And we thought that was a law of economics. Um, <laughs> and now he explains to us that it's not a law of economics. And I'll try to say a little bit more about it uh, uh, a little later. He's also provided us with an organizing framework for thinking about the evolution of inequality, um, of wealth, uh, which I think is very important. He's also uh, refocused attention on the role of inheritance as a source of inequality. Uh, there was a long period of time where people almost didn't talk about inheritance. Uh, the standard model was the life cycle model. The view was that people worked, saved, and uh, the dominant model in economics was this model of life cycle savings. And now, uh, you know, it, this work has helped refocus attention on inheritance as a source of inequality. Of course, the main focus is the inheritance of financial capital, but there's another important aspect, which is the inheritance of, of, of human capital, which uh, affects people's uh, productivity, wages, and so forth. And the basic idea here, as I say, I think can't be more emphasized, which is societies in which positions uh, in an, are in an essential way based on inheritance are fundamentally different from those in which positions arise from individuals' own efforts and abilities. You know, we like to believe ourselves as a, 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 a meritocracy, at least. Those at the top deserved it. It wasn't what they inherited. But increasingly, uh, this is not uh, so. Now, uh, he hasn't had uh, time to go through uh, the, rich, uh, the richness of his whole book, but one of the points that he calls attention to, and my own work called attention to, is the many ways in which uh, inequality is created. Um, the standard theory that dominated economics for a very long time was called the marginal productivity theory, that uh, people's wages were related to their contribution to society. You know, that idea was very much discredited in the 2008 recession where uh, the bankers who had brought the, their firm and the world to the brink of ruin walked off with huge bonuses. And no one could justify that as uh, their marginal productivity, their social contribution. Um, some people, some banks were so embarrassed they ch decided not to change the pay but to change the name. Uh, from performance bonus to retention bonus. Um, but there are all kinds of other aspects that, that uh, ways in which inequalities get generated, and I've listed them as on this slide, uh, but I've been told I don't have very much time, so uh, just take a quick look at that if you're a speed reader. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but the most important point is the one that he emphasized on one of his slides, is that inequality is not just the result of economic forces, but it's the, po but, but it's the result of policies and politics. And uh, if you looked at the, you know, the, the, the key variable that he stresses, which is the rate of interest relative to the rate of growth, it's the after-tax rate of interest, the after-tax rate of return. And what he points out is how that's changed. That's a, cha a result of politics the, uh, and the policies. Uh, it isn't inevitable that R be greater than G. It's the result of our policies. But of course, the policies are themselves are affected by the level and nature of inequality. And uh, Paul and I you know, talked a lot about how extremes of economic inequality that we have inevitably get translated into political inequality, and particularly when you have um, the rules of the game of the political process themselves being set in a political process which themselves are, uh, in which the wealthy have undue uh, influence. Uh, Thomas emphasized uh, wealth inequality, and I just want to talk about the fact that there are many other dimensions to inequality uh, that he talks about at various points. Um, the most important is opportunity. He referred to this as mobility. It's a chance of somebody at the bottom making it to the top, or bottom making it to the middle, making it to the top, or bottom making it to the middle. And uh, I thought it was very interesting. He referred to the fact that one of the reasons that the United States ra uh, has a, a very high, had a very high tax rate at the top was it didn't want to be like old Europe, 
Well, we've succeeded now to be worse than old Europe. Um, we now have a lower level of mobility than any of the other advanced countries, at least, or, or as, uh, one of the worst. There's different data sets and they, they give different numbers, but we are at the bottom of the advanced uh, countries. There are many other uh, specific aspects of inequality, again, which are, are related to our policies and politics. Uh, health inequality, America has probably the worst uh, inequalities of, of, of health in the sense that if you're at the bottom of the distribution, your life expectancy is very low relative to the top. So you have this divergence there. At least in the American context, some of these have much more political salience and are likely to engender a political response. And my feeling, I you know, testified uh, a week ago in Congress and the Senate, is very much that there is a, a really strong sense that something's wrong when we've lost the equality of opportunity. Because the notion of the American dream is something that's very much in our sense of self-identity and the sense of others' perception of us. And the fact that that is not true should be, and I think is, deeply di disturbing. Uh, there are all many other aspects of inequality. Um, he, again, emphasized uh, the uh, concentration at the top, but there are other aspects that are also going on that are, in the United States in particular, very disturbing. The hollowing out of the middle, increasing poverty at the bottom. And I think it's interesting that all of these are important, but probably the, the hollowing out of the middle is having the most salience right now in the United States. Um, the, uh, what I want to now uh, turn to is, is a set of uh, ideas that I thought, as I say, the book was very, very stimulating, and I want to, uh, maybe for many of this, this will be a little bit boring, but uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about reconciling uh, his book with standard growth theory. Um, because uh, these subjects have been, uh, 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 you, you're shaking your head, uh, Paul. You think okay, I shouldn't no. do this? What? What? You can go ahead. No, I, <laughs> I made a strategic decision not to. I've been thinking this, yeah, okay. Okay, well, uh, let me just spend a few minutes um, doing this. Um, so there are two questions. The distribution of income among the factor shares, that is to say, the division of national income between labor and capital, and the other one is the distribution of income and wealth among individuals. And the key questions are, are the recent observed patterns likely to continue? You know, as, as Thomas pointed out, uh, the, the share of the top 1% is now, or the shop, top 10% has now reached over 50%, and you saw that graph, and if you see that continuing, you get very, uh, you, you get, oh, it says stop. Oh, sh there's a conspiracy here between Paul and the, uh, uh, that tells me I'm not supposed to uh, uh, go on. Well, um, let, me, uh, let me go on very quickly to the last, um, last slide. The most plausible analyses, I think, lead to the view that uh, there is a, uh, not, it's not going to go on forever, but it can get, much larger, and the question of whether it goes on forever is not really the relevant question. The question if it's going to get much larger, we ought to be doing something uh, about it. There is a point I wanted to raise, and I won't be able to discuss, which is the difference between what you might call financial wealth, the value of wealth, and the number of machines, the, the, the cap productive capital. And a lot of what's been going on is uh, an increase in the value of financial capital uh, that has exceeded the increase in the capital stock, that is to say, productive machines. And I think that's important to understand a little bit uh, of the patterns uh, that we've uh, observed. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> um, the, the, okay. <laughs> Thomas emphasized the relationship between our, uh, the, rate, uh, the after tax return and the, the uh, rate of growth as a fundamental determinant <coughs> of, of uh, the concentration of wealth, the growth of wealth at the top. 
Uh, and I just wanted to emphasize that actually uh, there are several other factors, some of which he uh, uh, talks about in his book. Um, it's not just the average return on the capital, but it's the distribution of the returns and the persistence of those differences, differences especially across generations. Um, formally, we would talk about this as the nature of the stochastic process of describing uh, the returns, the uh, uh, population growth, um, uh, things like the aspects of the inheritance process, the number of children, the bequest function, <clears throat> the issues of a sort of uh, mating. Um, these are important because uh, the nature of the overall inequality, and again, the nature of the uh, uh, nature of the inequality of wealth, really is affected by this. There's an old saying in the United States about rags to riches in three generations, and that's an example that that you can have a lot of wealth but lose it uh, fairly fairly quickly. Um, I once asked uh, one of my friends, how did that particular person get to be a, uh, he was a, uh, uh, had about $5 billion, and I wondered how he got, got his money, and the answer was he inherited $10 million, billion. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the ways that you can get to become a five billionaire. Um, it's, it's the way I recommend. Um, so the, the bottom line is um, wealth inequality uh, is not likely to increase forever, but could become much worse unless it's offset by policy. Policy affects each of the variables that determines the process of, um, that I described before. For instance, one of the process uh, aspects is the extent of, of a sort of mating. But economic segregation, which, for which there's been evidence of increasing economic segregation, can affect the extent of uh, sort of mating, and the nature of our selective universities can affect that. The most important variable is taxing return to capital and, be and bequest, because that determines the relationship between the after-tax return and the rate of growth. And some of the research that, he di uh, that he's done that he didn't refer to shows that increasing the tax rate at the very top does not have an effect adverse effect on economic growth does not have a, a, the kind of adverse effect. Part of the reason, I believe, is because there's a very strong element of rank seeking, particularly at the top, so that it doesn't have the adverse effects that the, the, uh, those who have opposed those uh, increase of rates uh, have asserted. So that's why I think, uh, just in conclusion, uh, we can't be sure that in the next 50 years, trends of the last 30 will continue, but we should be worried there are many instruments at our disposal to create a more equal society, and many of these instruments would at the same time create a more efficient and better performing economy. Thank you. Uh, I'll explain this. Okay, so I, I should explain. Actually, I have, Basically, I was fascinated professionally by the same things that Joe was fascinated by professionally. This book is, if from, from the point of view of, of, of an economic researcher, the thing that really grabs you is that it does this kind of unified field theory where it takes together the theory of economic growth, the theory of the distribution of income between different factors, between capital and labor, and the theory of the distribution of wealth and income among individuals, and it at least sketches out the way that they can all come together, and I thought, Initially, preparing for this my event myself, I want to talk about that. And then I realized, no way I could do it in 10 minutes. So when Joe started to do it, I thought, no, Joe, you're not going to. It, it is fantastic stuff. And, and I, I, we want to hear more. But, but it's, um, um, so in fact, I, so th this is, and it, it is something. What, whatever else we say here, you do need to appreciate that there is a level of depth in, in, in this analysis, uh, and a level of sort of a sense of intellectual frontiers opening that is, is hard to hard to explain unless you're in the business yourself. Um, what I thought I would do instead um, is go a little bit um, meta and talk really about why are you all here and why are whoever is watching this, why are you watching, why, why has this book had such an enormous impact? Why, why, why is this something that is, is hitting with such force now? Um, and I, can, I think I have some perspective on this because I've worried about these issues. Um, uh, of inequality for a long time. 
Um, I, my first popular book, Age of Diminished Expectations, which was put out in 1989, had a chapter on inequality, including the 1%. Um, at the time, by the way, the, um, it was originally pu published under the auspices of the Washington Post, and they wanted me to take the chapter out. Uh, they said nobody wants to hear about that, but that, that in itself tells you something. Um, and my, so my version of the, the history of the whole list, there, there is, has been a long, there's been a lot of resistance to the notion that what is in fact happening to us is happening. And there have been a series of moments that I think of as being, oh yeah, guess what, moments. <laughs> and the, uh, um, and, and uh, Piketty's book is the latest and most important. Actually, he's, he's responsible for at least two of these moments. So the first one was, as it became increasingly apparent during the 1980s, that inequality was sharply on the upswing, there was a lot of denialism, a lot of attempts to deny that anything was really happening. And it, it took some time before it, uh, really at a certain point, that even the, the, uh, the survey data that, that uh, Janet Gornick talked about it, uh, made it clear that something, there'd been a dramatic shift in the way that, that our society was evolving. And you could say, oh yeah, guess what? Just look at, just look at the, the census survey data. You can't deny this at any point. Which didn't stop people from continuing to deny it. One thing you learn in this debate is that old arguments never go away, no matter how thoroughly refuted. They always come back. Uh, and actually, uh, Thomas says a few things about that as well. Um, the the uh, ability of, of, of elites to find people defending their position regardless. Um, but then there, then there was a next phase, which is still not entirely over, when people said, okay, well, there's some rise in inequality. But what it's really about is it's about education. And what you're looking at is, well, the top 20%, the well-educated people are doing well and the rest are doing bad. And you will still find people writing things saying, oh, never, you know, ne what's this stuff about the 1%? What matters is the inequality between the highly educated and the less well-educated, and we should address that. Um, and that's certainly not a, a non-existent issue, but at a certain point, uh, and to a large extent, thanks to the work of, of Piketty and the Piketty School, I guess we could say, uh, we, we, we got to say, oh yeah, guess what? It turned out that a very large part of the rise in inequality was in fact at the very top. It was not the highly educated pulling away from the rest, uh, or not, not solely or even mostly. Um, it was in very large part the, um, the, uh, the one percent pulling away from the next 19, and in fact the, the 0 0.1 percent pulling away. That it really was and is a very uh, dramatic, it's, it's, it is the very top that's driving a lot of what we're seeing in, in the changes in our society, which is, that was news, and it's still rejected by some people, but it's, I think it's, it's very important, it's, it's clearly a very big deal. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's, it, you know, I like to say, people think that it's about education, I like to say that high school teachers and hedge fund managers have similar uh, amounts of education. So it's not exactly the same evolution of incomes. Um, now, the, um, uh, even within that, there is a, uh, even, so if, if people concede that, and of course, again, no argument ever goes away in this debate, um, but if people concede that, they still say, well, okay, but this is not like Gilded Age inequality or Belle Epoque inequality. This is, because what we have is an inequality of, of earned income, that people are, um, are making a lot of money, certainly, that we have some people who are, who are earning lots of money, but it's not, it, it's that, it's, 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 it's wealth, uh, based upon, or it's, it's income based upon what people can do um, and therefore in some sense deserved and that's a questionable thing itself. And there's a lot of talk about the, um, there's a whole school of, of writing, you see this quite often, that says, well look, you know, take a look at star actors or athletes, you know, nobody else could do what they do so it's right for them to be earning a vast amount. Uh, to which actually there's a little sort of a minor, oh yeah, guess what, which is that actually, you know, those are not people like that are not an important part of the 1%. Um, it's overwhelmingly business executives. So if we're actually asking who we're talking about, we're pretty much talking about executives. Um, but even so, the argument was this is somehow earned income, it's not inherited wealth. Um, and uh, to which capital in the 21st century is a gigantic, oh yeah, guess what? Um, it's still true that in the United States, a large part of the increase in inequality since 1980 um, is about earned income or at least labor income, whether you th really think it's earned or not. Um, but um, but uh, Tomas says that about two, uh, that's only already about a third of it is, is capital. So in fact, we're already talking about a substantial amount. And the higher up in the income distribution you go, the more capital is responsible. And furthermore, it's moving. 
And you can see, now there, there are, the, there's the charts, there's the data in the book, there's the, the logic of the arguments, but also once you're sensitized to it, you start to realize, you start to, you look at the, the Forbes 400, which is not, again, a great scholarly careful data source, but still useful. You discover that, yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's Warren Buffett and Bill Gates up there at the top, but also uh, four Waltons and two Cokes uh, in, in the top 10, that there's a lot of inherited wealth already and that an awful lot of the people further down the distribution are like 80 years old, and so there's about to be a lot of inherited wealth in the top of the income distribution. We're clearly moving in that direction, um, even e in a way that, that will make it increasingly difficult to argue that we are, ours is an earnings-based inequality. It will look increasingly like a, a wealth-based inequality. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a very, that, that's a revelation. I think we haven't caught up with it. Uh, even, even the liberals, have not caught up with it. Uh, 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 Piketty, uh, you know, it's, it, he's got Jane Austen and Balzac. I think our, our cultural reference te tends to be uh, Oliver Stone. Um, and <laughs> the fact of the matter is that Gordon Gekko was a long time ago. Uh, that movie was 27 years ago. And Gordon Gekko is a predator, but he's a self-made predator. Uh, well, these days, <laughs> more, you're more likely to be dealing with Gordon Gekko's heirs. Uh, and it's, uh, that's a, uh, so we're actually, we, our picture, even, even on the left, our picture of, of what's happening is actually rapidly getting out of date because we are moving towards patrimonial capitalism. On the political economy, the, um, so the fear many of us have expressed, and Joe has expressed it, and, and it's, it's, it's implied very much in, in Piketty, uh, of a spiral in which the concentration of wealth leads to a concentration of power, which reinforce, which leads to policies that reinforce that concentration of wealth. I think that becomes a much more compelling story it, as, as you start to realize that it is about wealth. It's one thing to have people who are earning high incomes lobby for policies that let them keep more of those incomes. Uh, but it's much stronger if we're talking about dynasties that are able to push for policies that, that solidify the position of their dynasties. The, the, the logic of, the, of, of fearing a political spiral that leads you further and further into oligarchy is, is really quite compelling and disturbing. Uh, it's not one, actually, that even, even on the model that, that's underlying in the book, it's not one that goes on forever. There is, in fact, a limiting equilibrium distribution of, of wealth uh, where uh, Pareto, with, you know, where R, R minus G uh, drives everything, which is one of the things that, that, that I'm having fun with uh, professionally. Um, but it's, could be, it would presumably be much more unequal even than what we see today. And, and uh, one of the things you learn from capital is that, uh, is that this, we have an income distribution in the United States that is about as unequal as that of Belle Epoque Europe, but we're still evolving towards greater inequality. So we are heading towards a super level of inequality in the United States on current policies that will be like nothing you've seen before. Uh, just the last thing to say, to come back to it, they, this is all, oh, sorry, one last thing. Political economy, the, um, I found the discussion of the politics of the Third Republic. I think I've got the right republic, right? The third republic in France. Um, fascinating, because there you had a egalitarian ideology, but highly unequal reality, and in fact, the egalitarian ideology used to disguise what was going on, because you said, well, how, how can you say that we're unequal? Everybody has equal rights, and we've, we've, uh, we've broken up the aristocratic estates, um, and there's, a, you know, there, there's a sh many shades of that in US debate. I mean, we now have, uh, you know, Rick Santorum saying that class is not an un-American concept. We have no classes in this country. And so, yeah, so we can't talk about this at all. Um, okay, just the final word. The, the, this is, it's a fantastic book. It's, uh, it's intellectually fascinating. There's a, a level of, of depth to the analysis. It, it sort of solves, solves problems that people have worried at for, for decades and does it very elegantly. And um, let me just say a plug for the translator. Uh, it is, it is, I, it has to have been a wonderfully written book in French, but it's also a fantastically written book in English and uh, um, just, just the, 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 they, there are many ways I would have thought of describing the growing role of inheritance, uh, but the phrase, the past devours the future, just in itself conveys so much more than anything I would have ever thought of saying. So read this book, buy it, read it, and take it to heart. Thanks. I really did think about that. I mean, yeah. just couldn't do that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's a, a hard act or a pair of acts to follow. <laughs> a trio of acts, really. Uh, 
I, and I'm a little worried that I'm going to be the, uh, the spoil sport in the sense that I want to talk about uh, aspects of the book which I think uh, are going to warrant debate, places where I disagree, and, uh, and uh, in some sense I consider that part of the endorsement of the book which is it's a very serious uh, and powerful intellectual exercise. And it is not a book that is a functionalist in saying that uh, all bad things I can are tautologically associated with uh, a particular explanation, et cetera. And so really what I want to start off by saying is that the accolades are very much deserved. In other words, this is a book which I will have legs, it's, or it will stand the test of time. It will certainly be the case that it, uh, it redirects and uh, channels uh, scholarly research as well as public policy debate. Not only is the theoretical uh, framework in the way of conceptualizing the determinants of long-run uh, inequality original, it's also debatable. In other words, it's not something that uh, by itself uh, it is, is irrefutable or is not amenable to empirical assessment and the like. And the second thing is that the book also represents a profound combination of theoretical conceptual rigor and data work. And that sort of uh, combination is really remarkably uh, uncommon, at least in my, uh, my discipline. I don't think uh, uh, my uh, colleagues here would, uh, would think that that's unfair. So really what I wanted to, to do is to, uh, is to say something about where I think future research is going to proceed as a result of this book. So it's a, it's a, it's a narrow picture, nerdy perspective. And as I see it, there's really two issues or two dimensions that, uh, that warrant some comment. The first has to do with mechanisms. In other words, the book, uh, the body of, of the analysis comes down, as has already been described, to two ideas. One of them was this careful delineation of the details associated, the facts of inequality, and second, the linking of those facts to returns on capital as well as uh, aspects of the uh, return on labor, i.e. wages. And so the mechanisms, I think, are going to be the, uh, the focus of much future research. I think in addition, even though uh, Thomas uh, is actually a little bit uh, skeptical of it, I think that there's in, there are philosophical implications. In other words, when we talk about distributive justice and we li link it to inequality, the types of inequality that, that are focused on here are suggestive of new directions in how uh, egalitarian uh, justice needs to be conceptualized. So with respect to uh, the returns on capital and labor, uh, probably uh, uh, among uh, card-carrying members of the Economist Party, uh, there'll be quite a few questions about uh, this, the issue of the rate of return on capital. In other words, debates about whether this exceeding the rate of, of growth is, uh, is something that can occur over long horizons. Now, Partly that debate's going to be silly. Tomas demonstrated it, and it's an empirical fact, and that's uh, what needs to, uh, to be, uh, be understood. That said, I think that uh, the f one comment I do want to make in terms of the increasing returns is I felt that in, in some sense the book was, it wasn't clear to me whether it was the social determination of the rate of return on capital or it was something about technology. And to be, f to be clear, both of those factors are going to come into play. The reason I focus on that is the assumption, or let's say the, uh, the straw man that's being criticized of marginal product pricing, even under every idealization needed, is also presupposing something about the nature of technology. I think there are good reasons to believe that there are non-convexities or increasing returns to scale, which would call into question, would make the marginal product theory meaningless. But if these are the sources of high returns on the socially determined level of capital, that brings into play alternative policies than simply taxation per se. So I just really want that on the table that the technology uh, is probably uh, something worth, again, investigating. Second uh, comment, uh, and maybe I'll just quote the, the authors, he says that broadly speaking, the central fact is that the return on capital often inextricably intertwines elements of true entrepreneurial labor, an absolutely indispensable force of economic development, pure luck, one happens at the right moment to buy a promising asset at a good time, and what was this third thing? Outright theft. <laughs> All right, and so the, the, the point is, putting this on the table I think is important, and it's, but it also it sometimes begs the question, is if we move away from marginal productivity theory, what is the theory of pricing that we want to associate with returns on capital as well as the returns on wages? Now, 
it wasn't incumbent on Thoma to, to actually develop this theory of, of how these are being determined, but it strikes me as that's going to be where enormous amounts of research are going to be in terms of providing the, if you'll forgive the term, the micro foundations for the macro inequality picture that's being developed here. Okay, so uh, in wages, uh, he uh, is a little, he's a little bit, uh, 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 shall we say, uh, non-neoclassical, in which he says, I am not claiming that all eight wage inequality is determined by social norms of fair remuneration, and the theory of marginal productivity and the race between technology and education offers a plausible explanation of the long-term evolution of the wage distribution, at least up to a certain level of pay, in a certain degree of precision. And I think, that, again, this is a fundamental idea. It is certainly not accepted, despite all of the work in microeconomic theory that has moved beyond marginal productivity theory in the last uh, almost half century. But it, the, the question is going to then derive, uh, uh, develop, how do we develop empirical tests of alternatives to marginal productivity theory that can explain the observed patterns of wages? Now, one comment I want to, a thing to follow up there is that uh, there is something that uh, I wasn't entirely clear on in the book, which was the juxtaposition of increasing growth of capital and, uh, and stagnation of wages. And, then, and so even if you move away from cop double or all these technical assumptions, there is some intuition that a capital deepening in the economy is going to raise wages, and we simply don't see that. My own view is that what we, ha in fact, have is a decoupling of the economy between uh, different agents. And what I mean by that is you, you sort of think metaphorically about the difference between General Motors and Microsoft. Microsoft does not have a lot of blue collar workers associated with it. In other words, I think there's important issues of the endogeneity of technology in which you have the possibility in which techn technology and hence the production process evolves in ways that decouple both, uh, both uh, capital and labor in such a way that you don't get uh, even if there's a shrinking uh, share of the pie, an increasing pie that's uh, relevant for everyone. And so I primarily put that on the table. I would note that, that that idea is fundamental in many micro theories of disadvantage in things such as poverty traps. And what I mean by that is that I think much, con uh, I'm maybe self-servingly, much contemporary th uh, uh, thinking on, on, on poverty and disadvantage focuses on this idea that, that real disadvantage represents economic, racial, social segregation in which you have subsets of the population that are increasingly decoupled from the social and the uh, economic structures that, that, that link, link others up. And so I would put that on the table that I think that this issue of technology is uh, worth thinking about. Now, I have to be honest, I thought that this was the one part of the book that uh, was not as strong as the rest in the sense that uh, uh, I, 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 th I thought the rejection of marginal productivity was a little bit too facile because he focused, he, Tomas focused to a great deal on the unobservability of productivity. Uh, and and after, in that, I think I would, it's not that he was wrong, it's so much I would, I think right, right now is a bit of an assertion. And the question is how does one provide empirical evidence that that's the right mechanism? Uh, similarly, I think that the evidence uh, arguing that uh, CEO pay is not coupled to performance is, is weaker than the book suggests. Now that's, you know, that, that's, almost, that, that's a really technical remark in the sense that I think he's right. However, my assessment of the empirical literature is that the, uh, the evidence that's adduced in the book uh, is, 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 is relatively flimsy. Okay, and the final comment is, you know, as uh, sympathetic as I am, uh, having spent the last 15 years on it, I'm thinking about social norms and the like, these are damnably hard to make compelling econometric arguments on. Now, I emphasize econometric because an important theme in Tomas's book is there, is more, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in a, in a regression. But nevertheless, in terms of formal empirical arguments, that's going to be a, a, a tough one to demonstrate. All right. Now, the reason I keep saying what are the mechanisms in addition to the kind of these technical details and, of course, the positive question of how we want to think about uh, ameliorating inequalities, it strikes me that you need to know the mechanisms in order to talk about feasible policies. So in my judgment, in addition to taxes, it's natural to talk about corporate governance rules, financial regulation, intellectual property regime, and even increasing returns. And you need to have all of these on the table because once we have mechanisms, and then we can be more uh, uh, broad in terms of thinking about policy, which is something uh, that uh, Joe and Paul both, both emphasized. All right, so on the normative issues, uh, uh, there was a, 
you know, I, I want to argue there's also going to be some, there's some thinking that needs to be done. And so uh, Tomas says that uh, beyond all reason, the fortunes are perpetuating themselves beyond all reasonable limits and beyond any possible justification in terms of social utility. And that the fiscal approach is a way to move beyond the futile debate about the moral hierarchy of wealth. Well, my political philosopher friends are not going to like that one. But this, and the series points the following. And that is that uh, the reasonable limits, I, again, I think that, that was, uh, it was too easy in the sense that uh, if you look at where egalitarian justice is as a, as a philosophical endeavor, so much of it is focused on the idea of, of, of responsibility-sensitive egalitarianism. And so there is a hierarchy. There's a profound distinction between inherited wealth and wealth, even if it's uh, some combination of talent and rent-seeking or a talent for rent-seeking. Uh, and, and, and so I, I think that that has to be on the table as something that one needs to think about. And so that, uh, you know, again, is the, the, so in my view, the super managers and the rentiers aren't quite uh, linked up together. In fact, I claim that this is what Tomas's position is and that he was being unduly modest and that he's actually taking a philosophically different position on inequality. And what I mean by that's the following. From the so-called micro perspective on inequality, in which equality of opportunity is the natural object of interest, where the debates are have to do with how to think about the notion of responsibility, how to think about the notion of, of desert and make that operational in terms of designing policies, be they uh, having to do with school finance or uh, uh, the tax system and the like. In my judgment, what is fundamentally new here is an argument, frankly, that equality of outcomes matters. And this is really the argument on political economy that, that Joe and Paul put on the table. And what I mean by that is that if one had this idealized view of a bunch of farms that don't interact and one of them just produces 100 times as much as the next and everybody's eating well, there's not really a profound concern about inequality. However, the, and that farm analogy unfortunately lives in the minds of quite a few economists, I think. The reason that inequality of outcomes matters here is because of the, the zero-sum aspects of a social and a political, uh, of, our, of a modern society, such as political power, or the nature of status and uh, in relations, et cetera. And as a result, one has to, or I think one is necessarily obliged to look at extreme forms of inequality in terms of their social and political consequences and that moves the argument away from opportunities and you know, whether or not I have the right conditioning variables in and the like. And so notice that this argument is indep logically independent of whether or not the marginal productivity theory is true. There really is no ethical salience to that. After all, uh, a talented person doesn't deserve, I mean, these are kind of you know, standard arguments in philosophy. You say, of course, nobody deserves their genes. John Rawls, in fact, says that specifically in, uh, in his own writings. What matters here, and why the upper tail as opposed to the lower table when we talk about disadvantage and, uh, and poverty traps and the like, why this is, has to be now at the center of egalitarian thinking is because of these social and political consequences in which there is an, an inextricable, I don't, maybe not zero sum, but positional aspect that matters. And so let me, uh, let me stop there and, and congratulate you on a brilliant book. Well, I, I have almost no job because uh, <laughs> we have five minutes to reconcile the theory of growth and uh, you know, marginal productivity and determination of wage and rate of return. So can I, uh, I would like to actually pick up on something that was, I think, present in all three uh, discussions, uh, uh, you know, comments, and just put it to Toma as a question because I, I'm not sure we'll have much time for uh, repartees and the rest of the discussion. Let me put it like that, in very kind of stark terms. I think it was present in Paul's conclusion that his review uh, was raised by, by Joe and also by Stephen. If you have like a sort of stereotypical image of patrimonial capitalism in Europe, like circa 1914, where it was essentially dominated by large capital uh, holdings, as you explained, and then you have current US, which produces more or less the same outcome at the level of 1%, but where labor income, as you write, is more unequally distributed and is present in the top 1%. Do you see difference in political implications of the two? 
and in the implications for policy. Um, yeah, well, I guess the, the, my main response, f first, let me thank, you know, uh, Joe, Paul, and Steve for, for everything they said, and, you know, I'm very honored by what they've said and by uh, how you know, carefully they've read my book. Uh, le let me try to respond in the, the following manner. I think the, if this is what's happening uh, in, the, in the US, you know, this means that this is not, we are not at the end of the process, you know, this is not, so this can, as, 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 uh, as, uh, both Joe and Paul were saying, you know, this is going to keep rising and we could have the combination of this, uh, you know, very uh, sort of super managerial class with uh, super wealth uh, uh, class. And, and therefore, you know, the, the total concentration of income uh, could uh, well, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, even larger than what it was in uh, 1914 France or or, uh, you know, 1788 uh, France, you know, where, uh, you know, the aristocracy was between 1% and 2% of the population, so this is not, uh, you know, this is comparable in a, in a way. Now, what, what does this tell us about the political uh, reaction to this? Uh, you know, it's very complicated, you know, I, mean, I, I think it all depends on the, uh, on, the, on the ability of the elite and the entire system to persuade, uh, you know, the rest of society that this is viable. So, you know, the persuasion apparatus and, you know, in some countries, the repression apparatus, you know, can play an important role and make any inequality, uh, uh, you know, acceptable. So at the end, you know, this is a conflict in, uh, you know, you have different belief system about, uh, about inequality and, you know, it's a, it's a cultural and political and social history. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, the, the reason why I am not as pessimistic as, uh, uh, you know, a number of commentators that I hear here and there is that, you know, of course, in, in, in the 20th century, in Europe in particular, the world wars and, uh, you know, the Great Depression played a very large role to to induce a shift in policy. And, you know, in, in France, you know, nobody wanted progressive income tax uh, until World War I. And it was created just because there was a need for money to finance for the war. You know, it was not to build schools or to make uh, the inequality uh, go down. This was to pay for the war. And, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, people describe France as the land of equality where people want to reduce uh, inequality all the time. You know, of course not. You know, it's the, you have a different tradition in, in different countries and France certainly doesn't have this tradition. So wars played a very large role in inducing a change in attitude. The Bolshevik Revolution played a very large role. But in America, to some extent, uh, you know, the democratic institutions uh, uh, better played uh, their role because, you know, the impact of uh, World War I or the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, in the American political scene in the 1920s, you know, was much less uh, important than in Europe. And still there was this rise of, of progressive uh, income taxation and progressive estate taxation because, you know, many people in the U.S. did not like the, the, the way uh, inequality had been changing over the past uh, uh, several, you know, uh, previous decades, and, and there was a reaction of the political system. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that this will necessarily happen, you know, next year or next, but, you know, it's just, I don't see any, any reason to be, uh, you know, excessively uh, uh, pessimistic, you know, uh, so uh, we'll see. I see that you're all impatient to have one last minute. So can I just give one last minute, particularly on that point of the uh, uh, Thomas spoke a little bit of surprises, like the political system can move surprisingly and we might possibly have, you know, increased <coughs> taxation, which we could not have anticipated in 1909. Do you want to say something about that or maybe on the thing that he just addressed now about policy? Because you seem, not only Joe, oh. but everybody actually, I think I would like to give a chance to each of you one minute for that. Well, Do you see surprises coming? Okay, let, let me make just a couple points. What, one is actually on that chart, what's interesting uh, is that the U.S., uh, the chart up there, yeah, uh, if, if I understand that uh, the U.S. Tax, the tax rates, rates, marginal tax rates, oh, yeah. Yeah. At the top marginal tax rates, actually uh, in the middle of the 20s when we were having a boom in inequality, marginal tax rates came down to, uh, uh, at the top to 25 percent, so it, it wasn't the growth of the growth of inequality did not have 
the kind of uh, response that you might have hoped to say, where are we going? It was actually in the other direction. So that, that sort of reinforces the kind of pessimism that, that, uh, that some of us have, particularly in the United States where we have uh, uh, some Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United and the more recent court decisions that basically say corporations are people in terms of ability to spend uh, money on politics, but not in terms of accountability for their misdeeds. So um, there's an asymmetry that they have certain rights, but without uh, responsibilities. Um, there is one thing I, I do, do want to emphasize about what Steve said, um, which is uh, the point that uh, it's all the laws, regulations, the whole, everything that we do in the public sphere, from our education system to bankruptcy law to, to you know, absolutely everything that shapes inequality in the United States. And so once you realize that it's, it's absolutely every part of uh, the, the social framework, of the, you know, the, the, the political and social framework, you realize how difficult it's going to be to change inequality, but you also have the opportunity because we can start working on a number of different dimensions. There's not just one instrument, you know, not just the tax rate, but there's a whole array of instruments. But it also said, it tells us, you know, this is not going to be an easy, easy uh, battle. Okay, um, I think I'm going to be the voice of optimism, which is a highly, <laughs> a highly uncharacteristic role. God help me. Anyway, um, I'm not for sure, but I, I'm thinking about U.S. history a little bit, U.S. political history. Um, so uh, Thomas cites Irving Fisher, which is quite remarkable to see Irving Fisher, who we don't usually think of as being a big leftist, giving a speech that would have him tarred as such today. But the, the more obvious reference for Americans is actually Teddy Roosevelt. His 1910 speech about, about uh, reigning in great fortunes was very much, uh, you know, again, something that would be completely off the political landscape now, but maybe not forever. And what's interesting about that is if, if your view, the pessimistic view is that the, the 20th century, uh, with its narrowing of extreme inequality, was entirely the product of wars and catastrophes. But in fact, Teddy Roosevelt was giving that speech before uh, the wars. And in fact, if you read your Arthur Schlesinger, who I do believe taught here uh, at some point, uh, at the coming of the New Deal, you, see, you, real, you find that the New Deal did not spring, you know, from, uh, out, did not appear full-blown out of nowhere in, in 1932. That in fact, though, a lot of the political groundwork for, for the changes, for that top uh, up there, that top income tax rate, were laid over several decades preceding, which says that in fact, a democratic political system where there are national ideals, where people do in fact believe in equality of opportunity and to some extent in, in true democracy, which is undermined by extreme inequalities of, of income and wealth, is capable of reforming itself uh, even in the absence of catastrophes. So now we don't know, maybe, maybe that was them. Maybe, maybe our great grandfathers were living in a country that no longer exists, but you have to hope that that's not true and that we are capable in fact of, of eventually taking on board that we are becoming a country we don't want to be and doing something to reverse that. Stephen, you have a decisive vote. One yeah, optimist, uh, one pessimist. Oh, I, I'm a, I believe in the dialectic. <laughs> <laughs> right. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, following up Joe and Paul, if you think about you know, waves of egalitarian activity in American history, the New Deal is one episode. The progressive movement, which preceded right. the First World War, is a second one. I'll put another one on the table in which uh, there was a great sacrifice. It was the anti-slavery movement. Yeah. Now, why do I put, the, you know, which I know it sounds, if you think about it, that's the most important anti-inequality movement in the history of this country. Right. The point is the following, and that is that um, uh, the historian David Potter once said that the, uh, his definition of American exceptionalism was that uh, Americans don't believe in leveling down, they believe in leveling up. And so the substantive point is that as, that the impulse for reform will derive from the perception that inequalities of opportunity have reached unacceptable levels. And so that is the case where uh, Keynes, I don't, you're not going to be dead when it happens, but the point is economists and social scientists more generally are going to influence the political debate. And 
and we've just seen why perhaps the wealth accumulated by Bill Gates is not entirely earned. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm uh, afraid uh, we will have to conclude this session uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> on this note. Um, first, I really would like to say once again that it was really a pleasure first to have read uh, Thomas' book, which is actually what you can see from the discussions today. It's an extremely rich book. You have 200 years of basically economic history of the rich world. And it, on top of that, you have an intellectual and economic framework as Paul said, which tries to unify three theories. It's basically theory of growth, functional income distribution, and personal income distribution. So I'm sure that you would enjoy the book, and we have been extremely happy to have Thomas presented here in New York, and very happy that Joe, Paul, and Stephen accepted to comment on the book. So thank you very much for coming, and all the best.